Welcome to First NSB. It is good to be here with you on this Sunday morning, and um, welcome to guests. We always love to see new people in our church. My name's Luke. Uh, I'm the pastor here, and I'm just so glad to be able to gather with my church family on this Sunday morning. And let me go ahead and invite you now to open a Bible with me to Psalm 95. Psalm 95. And if you did not bring a Bible, just look underneath one of those chairs in front of you. You'll find a Bible there. Open it with us to Psalm 95. Psalm 95 this morning. So we are here to glorify God. That's why we're here. That's why we exist. That's why we have life in our body. We're here to bring glory to God. And we, here at First NSB, we bring glory to God as we pursue our mission of making disciples of Jesus. Now, we've talked about this in previous weeks, but a disciple of Jesus believes in Jesus lives for Jesus, is growing in Jesus, and is seeking to make more disciples of Jesus. Now, we as a church have a strategy. We have a game plan for how we go about making and maturing disciples. And it's these four words that be begin with the letter G, right? There are four verbs, but these four words represent for us our commitments as a church. This is how we go about disciple making and disciple maturing. We gather for worship. That's what we're doing right now. We've gathered on this Sunday morning and we have relationships with each other and those relationships are important. And if this is your first time with us, my hope is that it's not your last time with us. My hope is that you will discover this to be a welcoming place, that you will discover this to truly be a family, a place you can belong. And as we gather... We're gathered here to worship God. We group, right? You heard Pastor Michael talking about grouping for discipleship. If you're not in one of our community groups, next Sunday you're going to have an opportunity to meet the group leaders and to jump into one of our community groups. We group, and what is discipleship? Discipleship is about growing or developing as a believer or a follower of Jesus. And so we group with other believers for discipleship. We give. We give to support the mission of First NSB. So, so giving means that we reach into our wallets. We reach into our, in, into our, into our purses. We grab our checkbooks. We, we grab those little plastic cards. We, we, we grab the green stuff, the cash. And we give because we believe in the mission of Jesus. And we give to support the mission. We give our spiritual giftedness. Right, if you're a believer in Jesus, God has gifted you, and according to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, as each has received a gift, we're to use it to serve one another as good managers of the varied grace of God. So we give our time, we give our energy, we give of ourselves, we give of our finances to support the mission of the church. And then finally we go, and we live our lives day in and day out as followers of Jesus. We go as everyday disciples, 24-7, 365, where we live, where we work, where we play, as we're thinking, as we're talking, as we're acting, whatever we're doing, we should be doing for the glory of God. Now understand this, our going, that's our everyday lives, our going helps us to be ready to gather. Think about it this way, if you and I have been going as everyday disciples and we've been hearing from God daily and we've been talking to God daily, like we've been in the word of God, hearing God's word, reading God's word, we've been praying to God, we've been seeking God, when we gather together, we come ready, we come prepared. So our going encourages our gathering, our grouping, and our giving. So this morning, we want to talk about this first G, right? This first verb, gather. We gather for worship. Now, there's only one who's worthy of our worship. There's only one being in all of existence that's worthy of our life's devotion and our worship, and that's God. There's only one God. 
And God, as revealed in the Bible, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, the God revealed in the Bible is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God alone is worthy of our worship, is worthy of our praise, is worthy of our devotion. So we worship God. Hope you've got your Bibles open with me. We're in Psalm 95. Psalm 95. I want to read this um, in its entirety, and then I want to come back and I want to look at it more closely. So join with me as we begin Psalm 95. Here's what the worshiper invites. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah. As on the day at Massa in the wilderness when your fathers put me to the test. And put me to the proof though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. I want you to notice the worshiper invites others to join him in the worship of the Lord. Now, I want you to see three parts to this psalm. The, the first part, verses one through, fro, 1 through 5, is a call to exuberant worship, followed by the reasons for such worship. And then I want you to notice verses 6 and most of verse 7 is a call to reverent worship, followed by the reasons for such worship. And then finally, the very last part of verse 7 through verse 11 is a call to Hear God's voice and to obey. Church, we worship God together. And that's what the psalmist is here doing. He is inviting other worshipers. He is a worshiper inviting other worshipers to join him in the worship of God. At First NSB, we are committed to worshiping God together. I want you to notice here that we can certainly worship God on our own and we ought to do that but we also should worship God together and I want you to notice the corporate language the psalmist uses here notice the the phrase let us right let us notice verse 1 he says let us sing to the Lord let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation verse 2 let us come into his presence with thanksgiving let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Look at verse 6. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. And according to the psalmist, he describes the Lord, verse 1, as the rock of our salvation. Verse 6, our maker. Verse 7, our God. So just think about how the, the, the psalmist is communicating here. The Lord is the rock of my salvation. The Lord is my maker. The Lord is my God. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you put your faith in a crucified and risen Savior, Jesus, you've turned from your sin, you've put your faith in Him, the Lord is the rock of your salvation. The Lord is your maker. Well, even if you haven't trusted in Jesus, He's still your maker. The Lord is your God. So if those things are true of me, and if those things are true of you, then we can say with the psalmist, we can agree with the psalmist, and we can say, yes, the Lord is the rock of our salvation. 
The Lord is our maker. The Lord is our God. Notice the corporate language that the psalmist is here using. Together, we worship the Lord. So look, let's look at this more closely. We, we worship the Lord with exuberance or with excitement. Right? We worship God with exuberance. Notice the opening of the psalm. He says, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. I mean, this is excited. This is exuberant. I mean, it's okay if, if, if we get a little bit loud. Right? It's okay if you get a little bit excited. I mean, just think about who you're worshiping. Think about who you're directing your praise to. I mean, is God worthy of some excited, noisy worship? Is God worthy of us getting a little bit excited? I mean, we get excited about our sports teams. I mean, we get kind of crazy and fanatical sometimes, right? I mean, we're excited when our sports teams win the big games. And we get really sad when they lose, right? But I mean, your team wins the big game, you get excited, right? You go to your grandkid's t-ball game, you get excited as a grandparent when, when your grandkid hits the ball off the tee and they make it to first base. You might get a little charismatic, it's okay to get excited. It's okay to, to, to praise the Lord. It's, it's okay. And so here the psalmist is saying, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Well, why? Why? Because he's most deserving. You know, the Lord God is more deserving of our praise and he's more deserving of exuberance than your favorite sports team. He's more deserving of our passion and he's more deserving of our excitement. And he's more deserving of all that we have and all that we are than anything or anyone else. So after issuing this call to exuberant worship, he then gives the rationale for it. Look at verses 3 and following. He says this, for the Lord is a great God. And a great king above all gods. Now, the psalmist is not here telling us that there are any other actual gods other than the one true God. There are man-made gods. We see that in the Old Testament. We can see that in our present day. There's only one true God. But what the psalmist is here telling us is that the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also, the sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. He is without equal, he is sovereign, he is creator. Notice the poetic language here. It says, in his, in his hand are the depths of the earth. Verse 5, his hands formed the dry land. You think of the vastness of the earth. You think of, 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 of the deepest parts of the earth. You think of the highest of mountains. I don't know all the details on this, but evidently we landed something on Mars recently. Is that right? I don't remember how long it was, but it was a really long journey. Right, it's a long way to Mars. And it probably took a whole lot of smart people and a whole lot of money to get whatever they put on Mars on Mars. God just, just willed it and Mars was created in an instantaneous moment. God just willed it and, and not only the earth which is so small compared to the complexity and the vastness of the cosmos. Not only the earth and everything that is on the earth, but everything that exists was made at the will of God. And so here the psalmist, as he's calling people to the worship of God, he's saying, look, we're talking about a great God. We're talking about a great king above all gods. We're talking about the one who's in his hand are the depths of the earth, whose hands formed the dry land. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of adoration and praise. 
So we worship God with exuberance, but we worship God with reverence. Now, that's not to say that exuberant worship of God is irreverent. But by reverence here, I, I'm, I'm thinking submissiveness. A, a kind of humility with which we approach God. The psalmist invites the worshipers, verse 6, he says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. So here we have something other than exuberance. Something that is not make a joyful noise before the Lord, but rather it is let us worship and let's bow down. Let's kneel. Let's prostrate ourselves before God. And he describes the Lord as our maker. He says, verse 7, he gives the reason for why we should do such things, why we should come before God in reverence, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Church, we gather to worship a great God who is our God. Right, notice the psalmist tells us, at verse 3, for the Lord is a great God. And then he tells us at verse 7, for he is our God. The Lord is powerful and the Lord is personal. The Lord is royal and the Lord is relational. He is transcendent. He is greater than his creation. In fact, he is creator and he is imminent. He's close. He's our shepherd. So yes, by his word, the heavens and the earth came into existence. Yes, he is powerful. Yes, he is mighty and he is a great king above all gods. But he's our maker. He's our shepherd. And he loves us. He's at work among us. So we worship God with exuberance. We worship God with, with, with reverence. And when we gather, and, and this is where the psalm begins to, to take a transition. When we gather, we gather to hear from God and to obey God. Notice the last part of verse 7. The psalmist says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So here the psalmist, after inviting other worshipers to join him in the worship of God, to join in exuberant worship, to join in reverent worship, now he says, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. If you hear God's voice, don't turn away from him in rebellion. Now he mentions two places. He mentions Meribah and Massa. And there's two texts in the Old Testament that you can go back and look at later. I'm not going to look at them too closely, but Exodus chapter 17 mentions those two places. And Numbers chapter 14 mentions this 40 years that's referenced here in Psalm 95. By the way, you can also see this interacted with in Hebrews chapter 3 in the New Testament. But in Exodus chapter 17, the people of Israel have been brought out of the land of bondage. If you recall from the Old Testament, they had been enslaved by Pharaoh in Egypt for a long time. And God raised up a man, Moses, to be his leader to bring his people out of that land of bondage. And so they come out of the land of slavery, they go across the Red Sea, God is taking care of them, and they get thirsty. They get thirsty. And so in Exodus chapter 17, when there's no water for the people to drink, the people quarreled with their leader. They quarreled with Moses. Well, then Moses asks them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? 
the people grumbled against Moses. And in fact, here's what the people asked. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Now, you know what God did here? God provided for them. He gave them water. But it says here in Exodus 17 that Moses, it says he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? So they responded to God in a manner that wasn't filled with faith. They quarreled with Moses. They, they tested the Lord. But later on, Moses sends 12 men, 12 spies to check out the incredible land that God promised to give his people. A land described as flowing with milk and honey. And those 12 spies check out the land for 40 days. And after 40 days, they come back and they give their report. And 10 out of the 12 give a negative report. A report that is devoid of faith and trust in the God who brought them out of a land of slavery. And the people, rather than trusting in the promise of God, it says in Numbers 14, the people of Israel, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And here's what they say. They say, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And here's what they said to each other. Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Are you kidding me? You were slaves in Egypt. God brought you out of that land of bondage. God brought you miraculously through the Red Sea. You remember the wall of water on your right? You remember the water, wall of water on your left? God's been faithful. God's been providing all along the way. And here's God's response to his faithless, rebellious people. Forty years of judgment. One year for each day that the spies were in the land. Forty years they would wander in that wilderness until that generation died. In fact... The judgment is, in this wilderness they shall come to a full end, and there they shall die. So the psalmist who is inviting other worshipers to the exuberant worship of God, to the reverent worship of God, is offering this word of, 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 of caution. He's saying today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts. Don't harden your hearts like those in the past hardened their hearts. Don't harden your hearts like your ancestors hardened their hearts. Look at the judgment that, that came upon them as a result of their rebellion against God. Look at the judgment that came upon them as a result of them not believing in their God. Church, we gather to hear from God and to obey God. Let's not just gather to, to, to get excited and to worship the Lord with exuberance and to, and to fall before the Lord reverently. But let's resolve when we gather, we're going to hear from God and we're going to respond to God with faith and obedience. And so here we see worship is singing to the Lord, making a joyful noise to the Lord, giving thanks to the Lord, kneeling before the Lord, hearing from the Lord, obeying the Lord. Church, we gather for God's glory and our good. Like we gather, we come together for the glory of God. That's why we exist. That's why we are here, to glorify God. We gather as a church to glorify God. And it is for our good. It is for our spiritual good that we gather. In fact, gathering together 
to worship God as a church family, it's essential to our spiritual health and growth. We talked about it last week. Prayer is essential to our spiritual health and growth. We talked about it two weeks ago. God's word is essential to our spiritual health and growth. Corporate worship, worshiping with our church family, gathering together for the worship of God is essential to our spiritual health and growth. The writer of Hebrews invites his audience, Hebrews chapter 10, two verses, verses 24 and 25. The writer of Hebrews says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Now, as the writer of Hebrews issues this, this, this challenge or, or this command to his audience, he, he's saying, let us, notice the corporate language again, let us, the people of God, let us, believers in Jesus, let us give some intentional consideration. Let's give some thought to how we can encourage each other, how we can motivate each other, how we can stir up one another, how we can spur one another on to love and good works. Like that's something we do in relationship to one another. Like it's, it's reciprocal. It's something I do on your behalf and you do on my behalf and we do on behalf of each other. Let us consider how we might stir up one another to love and good works. And then he says this, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. So the way to accomplish it is, is not to stay away Right, staying away is not how we accomplish it. Failing to meet together is not how we do this, right? Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So he says, not neglecting to meet together, or not neglecting to gather together, as is the habit of some, but, it's a contrast, but encouraging. So encouraging... It implies here a togetherness, encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And I don't think that's just any day. I think that's a very special day. I think that's the future day of the Lord. I think that's the future coming of Christ. It's like as we anticipate the Lord's day, as we anticipate the return of Jesus, we encourage one another even more. David Mathis, in his book, Habits of Grace, writes this, The healthy Christian, introverted or not, of whatever temperament, in whatever season, seeks not to minimize relationships with his fellows in Christ, but maximize them. Do you hear that? The healthy Christian isn't about minimizing relationships with his fellows in Christ, but rather maximizing them. The New Testament is filled, the letters of the New Testament are filled with the so-called one another's, love one another. It's all over 1 John. Love one another. It's in John 13, 34, and 35. Serve one another. Encourage one another. Forgive one another. Church, we can't, I don't think, carry out all of these one another's if we isolate ourselves from one another. It seems to suggest a relational connection. It, it seems to be clear that if we're gonna if we're gonna obey these one another's, we gotta be in relationship with one another. Mathis writes further, he says this corporate worship is the single most important means of grace and our greatest weapon in the fight for joy. Because like no other means, corporate worship combines all three principles of God's ongoing grace, His word, prayer, and fellowship. So at First NSB, we are committed to gathering for worship. So, so let, me, let me close out by giving you some real practical stuff, okay? Let, let me encourage all of us Commit to be present. Commit to be present. When you were in school, maybe the teacher would go down the list and they, she'd call the names or he'd call the names and 
When your name was called, you'd say what? Present. Right? And when you said present, that meant you showed up for school that day. You were there. You were in your chair. And if when she called your name or he called your name, there was no answer, you were absent. Commit to be present. Show up. Church, there is no substitute for showing up. There is no substitute for being here, gathered together in the same physical space with your church family. And I think, if anything, the last 12 months has taught us that. There is no substitute for showing up. I mean, could you imagine, if, if, if you're married, could you imagine your marriage relationship taking place only on Zoom? I mean, could you imagine... I mean, that would stink, wouldn't it? I mean, could you imagine if, the, if your marriage relationship was, was just something that happened on some online platform or in some kind of virtual space? Imagine if that was the only way you interacted with your kids or your family members. And for some people, they, they, they've been online a lot. They've been on Zoom a lot. They've been on FaceTime a lot. They've been on Skype a lot. But it's no substitute for actually being physically present. You can't hold your spouse's hand on Zoom. You can't reach out and give your child a hug in some kind of virtual space. There's no substitute for being in the same physical space together. There's no substitute for showing up. Commit to be present. Now I know that we're online. In fact, we've got people right now, and I'm glad they're joining us. They're joining us online right now through our website, through Facebook, through YouTube. I'm thankful for every single person who's joining us online. And online is a great option when you're sick, when you're on vacation, when you're out of town, when you're working and you can't be here and maybe you've got to pick up the service later. Or for some reason, you're just not in the physical, in this physical geography, you can't be here, or, or, or you can't, for some reason, get to church, it's a great option. If you're still concerned about the threat of COVID, but there's no substitute to being here. Commit to be present. If, if you're concerned about COVID, and you're like, oh, I'm just not doing anything, I'm not going anywhere, okay, that's fine, but if you're going to restaurants, and you're going to other places, show up. Show up. Wear a mask. Stay away from people. And tell people to stay away from you. Just say, look, I don't want to do no fist bumping. I don't want to do no elbow bumping. I don't want to do no hugging. I don't want to do no handshaking. You stay away from me, and I'll stay away from you. I still love you. Now, I don't have a problem with fist bumping and elbow bumping. and That, that, that doesn't bother me. But if it bothers you, that's fine. Wear a mask and stay away from people. Keep your distance. Now, I'm still wearing a mask. Our, our staff is still wearing a mask. In fact, this week I ordered some uh, customized First NSB masks for our staff because we're going to keep wearing masks. Now, you may not think that a mask is effective, and that's fine. Whatever, I don't care. You may think a mask is a complete waste of time. That's fine. But if wearing a mask might put some other people at ease, if, if wearing a mask might encourage other people to show up, give me a mask. I'll wear the mask. I um, was thinking of a scripture. I actually have it in my notes here. I put it in here. It's in Philippians chapter 2. Paul says to the Philippians, he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or, or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then he goes on to give the example of Jesus who, I mean, we know Jesus is fully God, is fully man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, you and I may say, well, these masks, I mean, it's not really a big deal, and it's not. But if it could put others at ease, I'm okay with wearing a mask. 
If it can help in just a small way, I'm okay with wearing a mask. So commit to be present. Commit to be prepared. Commit to be prepared. Now, how do you prepare? Well, you're not preparing the sermon. You're not preparing the music. Right? Most of you are not on the tech team, so you're not concerned with the the technological aspects of the service. So how do we come prepared? Here's how. Honoring the Lord in our daily lives prepares us to honor the Lord when we gather together. What that means is, if I am living my life for Jesus in my everyday life, if I'm living my life for Jesus where I live, work, and play, if I'm pursuing the Lord, then when I gather with my church family, I'm ready, I'm prepared. Or let's put it this way, our going prepares us to gather. Going as an everyday disciple, reading your Bible, praying, exposing yourself to God's truth, obeying the Lord prepares us as a church when we gather for worship. So commit to be prepared, commit to be present, commit to be prepared. You might even decide to prepare by praying that the Lord would make you ready to worship with your church family. And I know this is an area where I need some work. I I need to be more intentional to pray for all kinds of things related to our worship gathering. I need to be better prepared. But what can we pray for? We can pray that God would be honored when we gather. We can pray that God would be glorified when we as a church family gather for worship at 9 o'clock and 1030 on Sunday mornings. We can pray for ourselves. God, would you help me to come before you and would you help me to worship you as you want to be worshipped today? God, would you help me to listen attentively to your word that's being proclaimed? God, would you help me to, to believe these words? God, would you help me to respond to them with obedience? Pray for ourselves. God, search me and know my heart. God, test me and know my concerns. God, see if there be any offensive way in me. And God, lead me in the way everlasting. We can pray for each other. We can pray for our brothers and sisters in Jesus. Do you know there's some people who pray during the first service? We don't have anybody doing it during during the 1030 service specifically. So if that's you, let me know. But we have people who pray specifically during the nine o'clock service. We can pray for each other. We can pray that that God would work in our brothers and sisters in Jesus. We can pray that God would work in the members of our community group, that God would, would reveal himself to them, that we would hear the voice of God, and that when we hear the voice of God, we wouldn't harden our hearts, but we'd believe and we'd obey. We can pray for unbelievers. Man, I hope there's some unbelievers that join us for worship on Sundays. I do. I hope that on a Sunday, I hope that any time we gather for worship, that there are unbelievers in our midst. We can pray for unbelievers. We can pray that that the God of heaven who saved us will open their eyes that they might see the truth of the gospel. We can pray for those unbelievers that God would help them to know that, yes, Jesus truly died on a cross for their sins. That they are sinners and they're deserving of judgment. They're deserving of of condemnation. They're deserving of hell. But the good news of the gospel is God gives us his love and his kindness through his son Jesus. We can pray for unbelievers that they will know Jesus who died on a cross for their sins and was gloriously raised from the dead and the God of heaven will draw them to Jesus and they will repent of their sin and put their faith in him. We can pray for that. We can pray for guests. We love to see new people in our church. There was a family I saw just before this, it was before this service started and somebody brought them over. It's like, where's the bathroom? It's like, well, it's across the street. There's two porta potties. I called the city manager and he told us we could use those. By the way, we're we're planning to have water next week, okay? Uh, Running water is not essential for worship, by the way. I don't know if you knew that or not, but uh, it is certainly a wonderful convenience. uh, but, But guests, we love to see guests. We can pray for guests. 
We can pray for guests that, that, that God would, would help them to feel welcome, that we as a church family would be welcoming to guests, that we would be welcoming to newcomers, that we would embrace them, and they would discover, you know what, this place really is a family. They really care about me. We can pray for unity in our church. We can pray for that we won't be distracted. Right? We can get distracted, can't we? I know I, I get distracted easily. Some of you may be dialed in and it takes a lot to distract you. It doesn't take a whole lot of anything to distract me. Right? Let me just give you a little pastoral PSA here. If you, if you talk to me before service, that's cool. But just make sure it's positive, okay? Right? Don't come to me with negativity before the service because I, I don't need to be tempted in that moment of frustration to, to bring it up here. Right? Wait till Monday. And pray about it before you come to me, okay? Talk to the Lord before you talk to me. And that's good advice for all of us, right? Well, let's talk to the Lord before we talk to each other about the things that are eating at us that the other person did, right? But we can get distracted, so let's pray that we not get distracted. That we not let things that aren't such a big deal become a big deal. Right? That we stay focused on what really matters. Right? What, what matters is not the platform design, although I like the platform design. I like what, what's been done with it. It looks cool. I like it. It's nice. It's clean. Looks good. Now, don't get married to this because it's not going to stay like this forever. Right? I mean, later this year, it's going to change. It's going to get refreshed. I don't know what it's going to look like then, but I think it'll look good. But don't get married to it because it's going to change, right? So this kind of stuff, we don't get married to it, and, and, and we, don't, we don't allow ourselves to be distracted, I hope not, by things that, that aren't that big of a deal. Right? We, we stay focused, and so let's pray that we wouldn't get distracted. Let's pray that we would stay focused, right? Because as a church, what, what, what's our mission? Make disciples, right? And, and if we're going to make disciples, church, we've got to be committed to what? What Paul said, the message of the cross, right? He says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. First NSB is uncompromisingly committed to the message of the cross of Jesus Christ and his glorious resurrection from the dead yeah. for the salvation of our souls. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I like the excitement. Exuberance. So church, let's pray that we not get distracted. Let's pray that we not let things that aren't that big of a deal become a bigger deal than they ought to be. Let's pray for our focus. Like, let's, let's come prepared. Right? And like I said, I, I, got, I got room for growth in this area. I do. So let's come prepared. Let's commit to participate. Notice in Psalm 95, the worshiper is inviting other worshipers to join in on the worship of God. He says, let us sing. Let us make a joyful noise. Right? So when you show up, Show up ready to participate, right? Show up ready to sing and sing. Even if you say, well, I don't sound good. Who cares? Sing anyways. We won't give you a microphone, but sing anyways. You may say, I don't really know the song. Well, show up enough and you'll start to learn the songs. Participate. Sing. Pray. When we open the Bible, open the Bible. Right? Open the Bible to Psalm 95. Let's hear God's word together. Let's believe God's word together. Let's commit to obey God's word together. Commit to participate. Let's be encouraged together. Let's be challenged together. Let's worship our great God together. So commit to be present, commit to be prepared, and commit to participate. And then let me say this final word here. Invite others to join us for worship. Invite others. Now, we don't want to keep what's happening here to ourselves. Right? We're, we're not some exclusive club. Like we, we really want to see new people join us here at First NSB. We want to see guests in both of our worship services every Sunday. 
And I'm not talking about guests who come from another church. I'm talking about people who, who maybe they've moved into our community or, or people who've maybe never been to church or they've never been to church in a long time. Or maybe they're not even believers. But you just reached out to that neighbor or that coworker or that person you know in the community and you just said to them, hey, why don't you come sit with me? On a Sunday morning at First NSB. Why don't you come and join me? I go to the 1030 worship service. Would you come and would you sit with me? They might show up. They might show up. I mean, I've invited people who haven't shown up. But I've also invited people who did show up. And they came back. And then they came back again. They might show up. The God of heaven might get a hold of them. He might open their eyes like he opened the eyes of Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians. And they might just repent of their sins and put their faith in Jesus Christ. They might be forever transformed. Invite others to join us for worship. So first NSB, let's commit. Let's commit to gathering. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Whether it's hot, whether it's cold, whether we got water or we don't, whether you're happy or sad, whether you've had a good week or a not so good week, let's commit Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to gather together. For the glory of God and for our spiritual good.